Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm the chairperson for UKC for the year 2015-2016. Uh, today we are interviewing Dr. Carlo Bonura. He's a senior teaching fellow at the Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS University of London. His areas of expertise include politics in Thailand and Malaysia and contemporary Islamic uh, political thought in Southeast Asia. So Dr. Carlo Bonura is one of the panelists at this year's project Amrat Nagara, um, hosted by UKC, being held currently in Imperial College and also being held in Edinburgh. Uh, so very fortunate to have Dr. Bunura speak to us for a short moment before he goes off for his panel. Um, so Dr. Bunura, um, like I said, you know, we your re area of research it is quite broad. It's quite you know, almost compart compartmentalized. So I think, you know, going through this interview, I think it would be nice to kind of explore different pockets of the of that kind of work. So I'd just like to start off with this idea of you know Muslim minorities in Southeast Asia. You do see that um, in places like South, the South Island. Um, you know, southern Philippines, and Malaysia as a you know, majority Muslim country has taken that has always been like a privileged position uh, in terms of the Muslim community. So, how do you think Malaysia's role has come in to play with our regional, you know, partners and you know, that community in terms of developing you know, this Islamic ideals and working with these Muslim uh, minorities? Well, I think that Malaysia sees itself as having a regional role. These regions have provided a very good opportunity for Malaysia to uh, to perform that role. In the southern Philippines, there's been a very formal uh, process in which, uh, obviously, Malaysia was the the facilitator and moderator for uh, the peace deal that was that resulted in the the Bangsamoro Basic Law in the southern Philippines. Uh, of course, conditions, political conditions in the Philippines may prevent that from uh, becoming a reality. And then, then it would be interesting to see what uh, can Malaysia do beyond uh, this facilitator role. In the southern Philippines, it's very interesting because Malaysia faces a security problem as well uh, with regard to the Sulu incursions. And uh, that is something, and now obviously with, with uh, possible, a threat possibly related to the Islamic State. These are, these are both um, uh, issues which I think are more complicated than actually the uh, facilitating the law itself. So there you see a slight disconnect between what Malaysia did diplomatically and the uh, c political complexities of this conflict uh, on, the, on the ground. And in Thailand, there's the same, the same dynamic at work. So you have uh, the Malaysian government over the course of the last, let's say, three decades reworking its position vis-a-vis -vis Malay nationalists in southern Thailand in the end of the by the by the 1980s I think the Malaysian government realized that it was no longer in, in their interest to support uh, separatist groups within within the within the region and what that uh, meant was that a, an important source of political support for the separatists uh, dried up and um, for a moment, uh, both with regard to uh, new political conditions that were put in place in the region by uh, Thai, the Thai authorities uh, in terms of um, working out a deal, I think, among political elites in southern Thailand uh, through in the 1980s and 90s, uh, which led to uh, a, a period of two decades of relative peace, but also the fact that uh, I think nationalists um, didn't have this political support from across on the other side of the border that produced conditions for relative stability. Now the instability that's been and the violence that's that's taken place in southern Thailand since 2004 has left I think the Malaysian government in a very difficult position because the these this is not a conflict like we had in the past. There is no there are no um, uh, highly organized, highly institutionalized uh, separatist groups that are fighting against the government. The, the violence is far more diffuse. There's a, a question of some of the small amount of the violence being driven by, let's say, Islamist militant cells, but not all the violence can be attributed to that. So it, it's, um, again, a situation in which the, mil the Malaysian government is, I think, hard-pressed to to really figure out its role. So you have two examples of this regional role being uh, being uh, taken. In the one case, uh, in the case of the Southern Philippines, it was a very formalized role. Uh, Malaysia, I think, prided itself on the outcome there, although the complexity on the ground is, is now potentially changing things. In the case of Southern Thailand, you have um, a situation which is really out of control in which neither 
uh, neither the Thai authorities nor the Malaysian authorities really know how to get a handle on it. And and I think it's remarkable at this point that that we haven't seen any violence uh, come up. You know, there's been no effect of cross border violence, and only I think in um, the early part of the stages of the conflict in. Uh, Maybe by 2006, 2007, you had small numbers of people being displaced in, into Malaysia. But it's been a very, it's a very uh, unique conflict in, in so far as it hasn't been fully internationalized. The, the displacement that's taken place so far has been internally internal displacement with Buddhists leaving the region, uh, and so it, it's hard, much harder, I think, for Malaysia to see a proper role in that regard. I mean, what do you think is Malaysia's motivations in pursuing, you know? these interventions, I mean, is it along political lines or lines of security, or is it taking on a religious tinge or a cultural tinge? You know, places like Southern Thailand have a lot of shared common culture with, you know, areas that are in the north of Kelantan, mm. the north of Kedaferlis. So what do you think, you know, motivates that interest in actually coming up? Because as you said, you know, a lot of the involvement has come up from, you know, Malaysian intervention as well, mm -hmm. um, in terms of the conflict in Southern Thailand. And that now is used as a justification for security, but what would have been the initial cause or the initial reasons? Well, I don't think there's anything broader in terms of seeing a, uh, a regional commitment to Malay communities. You know, I don't, I don't think that there's... Uh, there, it, it could be conceptualized like that, but I think that, that um, at least at the diplomatic level, uh, perhaps, I mean, I have no insight here, really. Uh, in, you know, I have no detailed insight, but my, my uh, presumption is that the Malaysian government knows that there's a slight danger there if they were to begin to make political claims about the, the nature of, let's say, a Malay dias diaspora outside yeah. of Malaysia. Um, certainly, like you said, that there are, there are these uh, deep connections, across cross-border connections, not simply in eastern on the east coast with Kelantan and Patani, but also on the west coast, there's a lot of traffic that takes place across this border. Um, but I think that uh, the governments and the, uh, the Thai and Malaysian government recognize that that border must be secure and that there shouldn't really be that any type of effort to to make political claims that might um, that might uh, inflame some type of communalism or some type of you know cross border nationalism would only complicate their the, that relationship. Uh, Having said that, this is, um, uh, I think there is a slight effort to, of diplomatic aggrandizement on the, on the part of the, of the Malaysian government because they see that this is a, a place for them to, to take on a regional role uh, in ways that perhaps only Indonesia you know, has the yeah. actual regional power to do. And so this is a, this is a, a very easy uh, you know, it's a very easy example of something that they can internationalize, play an important role in that. And uh, if there were, um, if there were, I don't want to use this language, but if there were points to be scored uh, at the diplomatic level, this would be the way to do it. You know, it's not a, there's not a lot at risk for the Malaysian government. Like I said, given the fact that there hasn't been the internationalization of the conflict, uh, it playing this role of in southern Thailand, playing this role of silent moderator or silent facilitator, the facilitator behind the scenes is very easy. And, uh, and I'm not sure how effective it's been. I, I don't know what the outcome of the current peace talks will be. And uh, the problem on the ground in southern Thailand is that uh, the, gov the Thai government does not know who to talk to. And I don't think that there's any uh, intelligence on, in, on the Malaysian side of the border um, that would actually uh, be any more detailed than the Thai intelligence. So. And kind of comparing that to the issues or the events in the southern Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. how do you think these have developed as well? Because I mean, the Philippines has it's a sea border. Yeah. You do have some cross uh, cross uh, cross border shared culture in terms of you know the Sulus, the Bajaus, you know people you know, nomadic sea tribes. Yeah. But you know beyond that, it's really hard to kind of make that you know distinct connection. So what do you think? That has an, you know, what do you think the effect of that has been on kind of Malaysia's involvement in it? I mean, yeah. of late it's been very security based again, yeah, yeah, yeah. inclusions and that kind of thing. But it is at the same time a very communalist, you know, uprising in a sense. Yeah, you could argue that there that the Malaysian government would like to see itself as being the kind of regional defender of Islamic interests, 
uh, in both cases, because in both cases you have governments that are in which uh, you have other religions as the majority religion being represented at a kind of formal level. Um, but again, that there's a, a slight problem with that because the uh, the militancy, particularly in the southern Philippines, the Islamic the Islamist militancy that you've you've um, seen there has been one which is not about uh, autonomy, but really about uh, kind of terrorism. It, it takes the form that is is not tolerable to uh, Malaysian security interests. So uh, even the uh, the MILF, I don't think that this was, you know, you have you really have to go back to the 80s to see an, an instance in which, um, to, to, to try to detect the uh, kind of um, uh, religious politics being involved in the way in which Malaysia uh, treats this issue. Now I think the governments, in, for, on these particular regions, uh, both the Filipino and the, or the Philippines and the um, Thai government see Malaysia as someone that they can, or as a government that they can trust to some degree. Uh, and that their its own interests aren't going to be um, uh, aren't going to be to affect its um, capacity to moderate. The point I will make in terms of Sabah is that you know you cited the kind of ethnic ties that could make uh, that could provide the grounds for some type of Malaysian. Sorry. The interesting thing about Sabah uh, is that you refer to um, examples of kind of cultural ties, cross border cultural ties, but actually, as we know the the real political question in Sabah is the presence of uh, large numbers of uh, Philippines nationals. And so uh, that makes that sea border very, you know, the relationship uh, that across that region very, very interesting because it's not simply um, questions of how the Malaysian government would somehow protect these communities in another country, but also what is the status of this community within Sabah? How does it change um, state politics in, in that state? Uh, and which is something obviously the Malaysian government is also very interested in. So. I think moving on to something a bit more related to the topics of today's discussion, um, which is on you know, the nature of democracy in Malaysia. And Dr. Bunura, you've done quite a bit of work in terms of looking at political thought in Southeast Asia. I think more on the Islamic side, but moving on a bit more generally, uh, I want to talk a bit about public participation in the political process. Uh, we've seen a lot of you know, growing participation, you know, protests, uh, different groups coming together, NGO statements here and there in Malaysia. And, you know, you have a lot of that similar development that's happened across ASEAN. You've seen in the people power movement in Philippines, you see coups in Thailand. So what do you think is the nature of public participation that has kind of developed across ASEAN? And what do you think has led to this kind of differences in each kind of develop in each in each country's development? Hmm. Uh, I think that when we look at public participation and particularly a particular uh, mass mobilizations like the People Power Movement or the um, the movements that we just saw in Thailand in 2014 or early 2000 excuse me 2013 or early 2014, uh, these are I I important events uh, and they reflect perhaps the changing nature of these polities. Uh, each in each context, however. Uh, mass mobilization uh, is structured by domestic dynamics. So in the case of the Philippines, you have um, mass mobilizations, uh, particularly in the people's power, the people power movements, uh, being tied to elite politics as much as they are about the kind of uh, public manifestation of um, broader organic, uh, some type of organic movement. Uh, certainly this, this led to a kind of democratization in the Philippines, but that um, the nature of the of democracy in the Philippines is one which is uh, very heavily structured by elite politics. Uh, in the case of Thailand, what you have is uh, these mass mobilizations taking place across a highly divided political uh, system, highly polarized, and uh, in fact that polarization. Uh, both enables the, the the extent of that polarization both enables enables this these kind of um, mass mobilizations. However, um, they also constrain the possibilities of these mobilizations. So, even if you, do, regardless of what side you're on, uh, on the one hand, if you're um, a royalist or if you're if you're um, supportive of this uh, of the Thai political the old political establishment. Uh, I would argue that those mobilizations were absolutely critical to trying to, to see some type of democratic potential in, 
in Thai politics. However, the, the substance of those mobilizations were completely antithetical to a more inclusive understanding of, of democracy. And the same thing is true with the, with the red shirt protests uh, from 2010 uh, uh, onwards, or from it, or the pro toxin protests in the early days of, let's say, uh, 2005, 2006, and um, then the, the protests in 2010. These were protests that uh, drew in a lot of uh, different people from parts of the country that often are excluded from national politics in Thailand, and yet at the same time, uh, you ha we have to ask what, whose interests did these governments serve, what type of um, uh, autocratic elements was uh, the Toxin and his governments, what type of auto autocratic elements did they depend on for their power, and so it's a very, it's very difficult. It's difficult to see a, um, a real democratic space emerging from these mobilizations. In the case of Malaysia, what we find, uh, I think, is really fascinating, which is that at the time that at a time in Malaysian politics, when um, it seems like political parties that we traditionally have uh, viewed as the uh, as highly stable elements within Malaysian politics, at a time when they themselves are facing uh, such massive uncertainty. Movements like Bursi, and I would argue even the red shirt, you know, the pro-Malay rights uh, movement that we saw over the last year, that these are, these are playing a very, very important role uh, in either filling a, a political vacuum, you could argue, but um, they're playing a very important role in the, let's say, expansion of, um, of democratic space in Malaysia. Again, the problem is that these are these movements are emerging in in uh, a context which is highly uh, autocratic, and um, and therefore the again exactly it's the same thing I think the same type of dynamic that I, that we see in Thailand. On the one hand, these um, uh, these mass mobilizations are enabled by the the recent uncertain political uncertainty in in Malaysia, but at, uh, at the same time the potential is constrained. So even in the case of the, or especially I would argue in the case of the, um, the red shirt protests that we saw, these were to some degree pro providing political cover for, the, for um, Prime Minister Najib's uh, uh, government. And as a result, we, we, you can't see that as a fully organic uh, movement. Bursi is, um, I think Bursi, Bursi faces some of the same uh, problems with its ties to the opposition coalition. And I think it's very interesting that after the fracturing of uh, Pakatan Rakyat, what you had was a fairly strong show showing by Bursi. That's, that is the type of uh, developments that indicate that there is some, there's still some, uh, let's say, hope for democratic social movements in Malaysia. I guess in particular it's kind of social movements that are not tied to party politics or tied to a certain support group. Mm -hmm. Just organic in the sense that you laid it out, but I think you know it does make the system a bit more chaotic. You do have a lot of opposing views, and you did mention this fact that you know these are increasingly autocratic. If you want to use the term, you yeah. know, states. You know, so is that development good or is it bad for the country in terms of its process as a democratic nation? Well, I think the. I think it's important to understand where the chaos is located because it's not simply that there, the chaos isn't simply that there are people on the streets. I think the chaos is that these movements are representing issues and concerns that don't fit uh, with the type of communalist uh, structure of Malaysian electoral politics. And that's a really, that's a huge, um, it's a huge, it, it is having a huge effect on, uh, on Malaysian politics. The fact that uh, the more, the, the more and more polarized the system becomes, or let's say the the um, the more that uh, I mean to be crude about this, the more that uh, Najib's government struggles to retain its position and consolidate its authority, uh, the um, the less traditional political parties are able to represent uh, or engage in politics in the way in which they did in the in the past. So this isn't simply about, it's no longer about, um, uh, as we've seen, of course, with the, the way in which the political landscape is fractured over the last year or two years, uh, it's no longer simply about representing Malay rights or representing uh, Chinese or Indian communities. Uh, this is about representing certain constituencies within these communities, and that's becoming more and more difficult to maintain at a party level. But it's it's very uh, easy 
to represent these new concerns. In the case of Bursi, this is a, let's say, a non-communalist, uh, potentially, I mean, depending on who, what your political point of view is, it's a potentially a non-communalist uh, formation, and so that's difficult for parties to grapple with. Uh, and at the same time, with the redshirt protests, uh, this is um, it represented certain constituencies within the Malay community nationally, and that also is difficult uh, for parties to grapple with as well. Okay. Um, in terms of, I mean, there's a final question on that topic. Yep. You know, in terms of this idea of communalism and moving away from these ideals, do you think it is a shift that's happening increasingly in Malaysia, or do you think it's something that's still limited in terms of you know exposure to the West, like exposure to you know, foreign media, things like this, where mm. these ideals may not necessarily, you know, hold proof for certain communities. So, you know, one of the criticisms with Bursay was that it was a very urbanized, yeah. you know, movement. And my honest opinion is that, you know, it is because these urban communities are used to, you know, having ideals and thoughts that transcend communal, yeah. you know, systems, communal boundaries. And party politics in Malaysia, especially the old guard of Barisan National, have been built on this system. Yeah. But do you think that shift in you know the electorate's position is happening at a quicker pace, or is it you know being matched by the partisan developments you know to satisfy their taste? Going one way yeah, yeah. Uh, I think if you if we conceptualize this with regard to what the electorate uh, is looking for, or if we wanted to generalize it to the electorate, then it's obvious that. Uh, that there are certain, there's a kind of political geography in place right now in which certain uh, parts of the country are far more uh, willing to uh, look elsewhere, uh, look to non-communalist forms of political representation, and other uh, parts of the country are uh, still uh, engaged in fairly traditional politics. But I, I don't, I think it would be a mistake though to, to argue that these changes are being uh, are emerging from the bottom up. I think uh, the, the th what you find, this tension that you find in contemporary Malaysian politics is that at the very moment at which uh, communalism is having, a, these parties are having a hard time to organize themselves along communal lines, um, you find intense amounts of um, a religious politics, you know, the hi higher profile controversies, more um, contestation along lines of religion, and also the same thing in terms of ethnicity. So you find a broader politicians engaging in uh, uh, in national politics in ways which really try to uh, polarize the country along these lines of religion and community, excuse me, and ethnicity, even though uh, things are becoming more chaotic. So going back to this question of chaos, which is actually or how the chaotic nature of Malaysian politics, um, it's hard to, to identify uh, the source for this, because the on the one hand you have a, a politics in place, which is um, is politicizing these issues in ways that are only making it more difficult for people to come together across communal lines. But at the same time, the structure that we have in place is simply not able capable to gra uh, grapple with um, these new conditions. So, all right. So I think moving on to the final theme on you know, uh, it's something you touched on earlier about you know, kind of the growing autocratic nature of politics of, government, of the role of the state, especially in you know, Malaysia and Thailand. Mm. And I think, you know, Malaysia is a relatively young country. We're coming to 58, no, 59 years old, uh, at least compared to the UK. And, you know, this idea of how democracy has developed in Malaysia and, you know, almost kind of the priorities that the nation took, you know, mm -hmm. in its early years, I think comparatively, you know, similar to places like Thailand or Indonesia, you know, you, they, we took a we took a position that we wanted to promote kind of development, or promote mm. you know economic gains, and some would argue that the byproduct of that was leaving aside democracy or participation or civil liberties. So, what would be your kind of explanation of views on this um, notion of development? Well, I think that uh, development has and developmentalism as a kind of state ideology has played an absolutely critical part in the uh, political structure of the region as a whole. Uh, I think that if we want to understand the uh, the autocratic nature of uh, contemporary politics across more open societies, with uh, countries within Southeast Asia, we have to look at the relationship between this kind of political economy that's been put in place, the relationship between privileging economic development uh, above, um, let's say, 
political protections or, or rights-based um, uh, systems. Uh, in the case of what's what's really remarkable across the region is that political elites have been very effective at uh, let's say sequestering economic development in the face of highly uh, um, or just intense uh, moments of political instability. So just to take the example of uh, the Thai government, what we find now is uh, uh, in in the wake of the 2014 coup is a government which is really capable incapable of uh, stimulating uh, economic growth. And many people would argue that it was its uh, capacity for economic management in general is very low. Uh, this is not the way that Thai coups have typically taken place. Usually, if you look at what happened after the, in the wake of the 2006 coup, I think economic growth was back to normal or you know in the five, six percent range uh, after only just a year. So to have two and a half year, or two years uh, of slow economic growth is is something which is surprising. The reason why this matters at all is because I think the military governments have, uh, Thai governments in general, have uh, held economic growth as absolutely critical to their own legitimacy and uh, that uh, failing economic growth could really hamper uh, domestic support for the government. That notion of legitimacy, a, a, a notion of legitimacy which is directly tied to the question of economic development is not one which can be conceptualized in terms of a constitution or in terms of uh, a political I uh, ideology. You don't vote for some you vote for someone because perhaps because they they can uh, provide uh, economic security for you, uh, but you you don't vote let's say on a kind of neoliberal platform. So this developmentalism is is closely tied to notions of. Uh, important notions of nationalism, as you said, it's prioritized in the wake of uh, of um, decolonization. But there are uh, there are critical elements of um, developmentalism which lead directly to autocracy and and directly to um, uh, uh, political expectations by elites that as long as they deliver on the economic front, they don't have to deliver deliver on the political front. Could, could that be one of the reasons for this tension we talked about earlier in terms of public participation? I mean, if the country or the state no longer hits its economic goals, and it could be for a myriad of reasons, it may not be internal reasons, yeah. but if you know the elites are expecting everyone to go along with it, could that be one of the tensions that arise from this kind of notion or this kind of political thought? Yeah, I think in, ter in terms of public participation and, and mass mobilizations, again, even in the face of, uh, I think in November... 2013, when we had the first wave of mass mobilizations, this there were expectations that this would hit economic growth in Thailand, but it really didn't uh, affect the economy until uh, the first part of 2014. And, and and if you if you look at the way in which the Indonesian uh, economy recovered relatively quickly after, um, I mean, in terms of growth rates, not in terms of other indicators, but after the end of Suharto, uh, in uh, after taking a massive hit uh, when Suharto fell, um, or if we think about Malaysia in uh, 1997, the way it was able to experience the Asian financial crisis and and rebound, th th these are the um, these. This is the kind of performance, economic performance, that political elites expect, and they, I think, expect international uh, investors and banks and uh, regional. Um, development uh, agencies to recognize these governments for what they do best, which is produce uh, economic growth, and to not necessarily press uh, on issues related to human rights or um, democratization. So, But do you think, I mean, part of that also comes with kind of a strong central leadership or a strong state role that you can play to you know, bring the country back up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and the developmentalism is, is I would argue, uh, it, it, it depends upon a strong state. Uh, it may not, uh, in fact, one of the ironies perhaps is that it may not depend upon large, strong state capacity. So the, the state's ability to um, crack down on corruption or to uh, govern in the most, um, let's say, efficient or effective way, that may not be part of the picture. Uh, but certain, because those those things would necessarily require a certain level of transparency that, that uh, political elites may not be comfortable with. Um, but certainly, uh, the, within the within the region, it's been clear that uh, that typically 
economic growth is best facilitated through strong, th strong states, strong centralized power. And I guess that's something that you know the region has developed over time. And I think we see that more and more. You know, we, like you said, mass mobilizations, people coming onto the streets. You know, it is changing times. I think. You know, I mean, would yeah. you agree with the fact that you know people are no longer may not necessarily agree with this kind of position um, anymore? Yeah, it would, that would be a very interesting question. I think to look at. Uh, because these are these large scale protests in in uh, this variety, this uh, large array of countries, uh, they're taking place for uh, different reasons. Let's say the if we uh, compare the anti corruption protests, we very very interesting to see who makes up these uh, these protesters, what elements of uh, these protesters are there precisely. Uh, you know, are there elements of these protests that are anti capitalist? Are there elements that are simply anti state, anti corruption? Um, it would be interesting to look at uh, exactly um, what's motivating these protests. The, uh, you know, the, there's a, a, a deeper question, which is perhaps can you have uh, uh, large, expansive, um, democratic, uh, can you have large, uh, you know, very significant developments in terms of democratization and still retain this developmentalism? I don't think necessarily that they are, uh, obviously, there are states around the world that have that prioritize um, capitalist development, uh, and uh, many of them are not intensely autocratic. So the real question here is the the um, the dynamics, perhaps, that are structuring these uh, these states, and perhaps how developmentalism enables that type of arbitrary political rule. Uh, and uh, it's it would be interesting to, to to think about what role. Uh, mass mobilizations could play in in changing that. So I'm I'm not sure how much you've looked into this, but you know how much do you agree with this kind of Asian values notion of um, the system of democracy that's come up in Asia you know, within South yeah, Asia. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that this is a cultural. Um, the, the, I don't think there's anything cultural to this. The particularly in in uh, in Thailand to take Thailand as the as an example that I know. Uh, fairly well. <clears throat> if you recently, there was a symposium about SOAS related to the rule of law in Thailand, and somebody raised the point that um, isn't this, uh, you know, what would you say to someone who argued in defense of Thai law? And the answer is, what is Thai law? What constitutes Thai law? You know, there was the uh, codes that are in place today are were hugely influenced by European colonial uh, powers. The modern-day commercial codes are influenced by uh, demands that are global in nature, whether they're taken from other parts of commercial law uh, across the world, and let's say the North Atlantic, or whether they're uh, even even the question of uh, ASEAN economic um, uh, integration. Uh, and then you have um, this uh, this question of uh, the, of autocratic politics, right? What what is necessarily tie about um, these type of political structures? So, in the case of that, that that isn't to say that there aren't these cultural institutions which which have uh, which play a huge role in national politics. So, obviously, the the aristocracy and the monarchy in Thailand, in Malaysia, what we're experiencing is a very interesting uh, ri rise of aristocratic politics after um, uh, you know after its decline under uh, Mahathir. Uh, so there are these certainly culturalist institutions that affect politics, but the actual um, these dynamics of polarization, of communalism, of uh, you know we, we talk about communalism, we don't necessarily talk about necessarily cultural difference. It's yeah. not cultural difference which is structuring these these um, this politics. It's uh, the way in which communal identities be are, are transformed into political interests and political structures. So that's really what's at what's at stake. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Carlo. Thank you. Uh, this has been an interview for Chakuba UKC. Thank you.